This is 50 Feminist States, a road-tripping storytelling podcast visiting all 50 U.S. states to interview feminist activists and artists about their work for gender justice. I'm Amelia Ruby, and this week, we're in Nebraska. It is illegal to have an assisted home birth in Nebraska. I know that birth happens and there's no criminalization of people that are birthing children should it happen at home. But if a certified midwife is to attend that, it is considered illegal. And there are there's a history of prosecution and persecution of said people that are attending these births. When you're going about a project involving all 50 U.S. states, Nebraska isn't an obvious starting point by any measure. But for me and my family, the United States really began in Nebraska. As far as we know, my great-grandparents on both sides of the family came to Nebraska from Europe when they immigrated to the U.S. in the late 19th century. At that point, the land they settled on, in what is now central Nebraska, was still being treated and stolen from the Pawnee Nation. I don't know the exact timeline of events, but my family likely started their farms on land taken from the Pawnee people in 1857, perhaps only a few decades after the Pawnee Reservation was dissolved for the sake of white settlers. I start this podcast about the state of feminism in the 50 U.S. states with an acknowledgement of this colonial history, because it cannot be avoided that the history in the present of the United States is a colonial one. Each of the 50 states that now make up the U.S. were populated by diverse peoples with their own languages, cultures, and technologies that were often eradicated by the U.S. government to form the states we're now familiar with. The U.S. is also still in the business of colonial occupation, maintaining the territories of Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. All of this is to say that any project that attempts to explore the United States by state has to acknowledge that state boundaries were formed contentiously and most often violently. To get back to Nebraska, in Nebraska today, there are still five reservations that serve as homes to the Santee Sioux, Omaha, Ponca, Sac and Fox, and Winnebago tribes. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, their peoples make up an estimated 1.5% of the Nebraska population, which is otherwise 79% white. When you ask people what they think of when they think about Nebraska, regardless of whether or not they're from this state, you probably get one of two answers. Corn or corn huskers. Nebraska is the third highest corn producing state in the U.S. after Iowa and Illinois. But I've always thought it's the corn huskers, the state football team that gets people to connect Nebraska and corn. Football is a big deal in Nebraska. And that may be the understatement of the century. The Nebraska Cornhuskers have the fourth most victories in NCAA Division I football. And on game days, Memorial Stadium, where the Huskers play, has the third highest population of any city in Nebraska. Holding 90,000 people, it beats out the normal third place city, Bellevue, by 40,000 folks. This is what Nebraska tends to be known for on a national scale. But I'm not here to talk about football. In terms of feminism, Nebraska, like many of the states in this season, isn't making headlines for its feminist politics, at least not in any positive way. In fact, in 2015, the Institute for Women's Policy Research ranked Nebraska second to last among U.S. states for reproductive rights, which they define as, I'm quoting here, having the ability to decide whether and when to have children. I think this ranking goes back to the fact that in 2010, Nebraska was the first state to implement a 20-week abortion ban, a move that was then replicated by 21 states, a few of which have put in place an 18-week abortion ban. More recently in Nebraska, this year, the governor, Pete Ricketts, added a proposal to the Nebraska budget to take Title X federal funding for family planning from clinics in the state that offered a referred abortion services. The budget that was eventually signed into law ended up eliminating federal funding for Planned Parenthood in Nebraska and required extensive negotiation in the legislature in order not to cut funding for all clinics providing Title X reproductive health care. In the end, Ricketts argued, and this quote was splashed all over articles I found about these events, Nebraska is a pro-life state 
and the state's budget should reflect those values. To understand more about the state of reproductive rights and justice in Nebraska, I spoke to three feminists who are working on birthing rights and doula programming in the state, Coop, Amber, and Alex. Coop is a community organizer from Minneapolis with a background in youth work and sexual and reproductive health. They're now living in Lincoln, studying to be a medical assistant. Amber is a birth worker who spent most of their life in Nebraska and is building a career as a doula, attending births, doing placenta encapsulation, and developing childbirth resources. And Alex is an herbalist who grew up in Lincoln, went away for a number of years, and has returned to continue her work in herbalism and raise her young child. I connected with this group because Coop had put up a flyer about doula services at a local coffee shop. So I thought we'd begin by talking about what a doula is. This is Coop. I've been trying to come up with like a new elevator speech to talk about what a doula is because often people are just like, well, the Greek term translates to like woman servant. And for me, it's just just like uh, historically doulas have been namely cis women supporting other cis women through pregnancy uh, and labor. And now more recently, as doulas have really caught on, that's meant like white cis women of privilege, supporting other white cis women of privilege through pregnancy and labor. And Full Spectrum came to be a recognition that um, this other phrase that's been bounced around of like womb continuum, that pregnancy is something that can happen to an individual, but things happen before and things happen after. And that's, you need support before and after. And so then it became, how do we talk about contraception? How do we talk about family planning? (laughs) And how do we talk about like postpartum? And then it became miscarriage. And it wasn't until lately that um, abortion got thrown into that as if someone chooses to become pregnant or they don't, like here's another option presented just as it would be presented to talk about adoption or IVF or surrogacy or any number of things. And now what I really appreciate is that the full spectrum doula continuum is now including death and dying. And it's being led by like POC and indigenous folks of bringing back what is and always has been um, the fact that what, what a doula is conceptually is just how communities should be caring for one another and how communities have cared for each other for centuries Here's Amber chiming in about her sense of birth work. So this is something that I have been recently like unlearning myself and really expanding on. I guess I at one point when I started doing this work, I would describe birth work as like supporting women through the birth process and I think now that it is uh it's, it's so much more expansive than that. It really just comes down to people getting the experiences that they want and having access and choice. Yeah, and so when I decided that I wanted to do full-spectrum doula work as someone who now identifies as gender fluid and has done a physical transition and works with gender in a number of ways, um, birth work for me is how are we supporting people whose bodies are able to become pregnant but also How are we supporting our communities and providing care? Um, Because birth for me is is a newness. Like I keep thinking about it over and over, and I think that birth work can be more than how are we just supporting pregnant people, or how are we just supporting people who want to become pregnant or who don't want to become pregnant. That for me, that and that means that so many people's um, abilities and perspectives and options and choices, and so. It's more of like, how can I support my community? For me, that's what birth work is. Um, It's how do we create intergenerational communities um, that see people where they're at. When Amber and Coop talk here about access, choice, and creating the communities they want to see, a lot of this has to do with the fact that those spaces are not available in Nebraska or accessible to all populations. Amber shared a bit more about this working as a doula in Nebraska, I was really noticing through working for this agency of birth workers is that there 100% was this demographic of wealthy white women. And I was told things like doula care is a luxury. You know, it's something that not everyone needs. And that's something that I don't believe at all. And I wanted to add religion too. And something that I noticed that I was, I was pretty surprised getting into this work in Nebraska is that my experience has been birth work and, and doula work has been so 
ingrained in religion too and like religion shaping almost who accesses like the doula work and birth work and like the politics surrounding it too and even like the politics around like like working with midwives and like working at birth centers it's just yeah it's like really ingrained in religion and I think that's something that's really interesting too. What's important to understand here is that home births are illegal in Nebraska. So the type of birth someone has is determined by the institutional spaces available for giving birth. And in Nebraska, the hospital landscape has a strong Catholic influence. According to the ACLU, 40% of hospital beds in the state are in Catholic facilities. There's been a lot of publicity in Nebraska about the new birth center that, while in a hospital, is run by certified nurse midwives and provides more natural birthing options to people giving birth. However, that facility is still located in a Catholic Health Initiatives, or CHI, hospital. Amber explains more of this here, and then Alex shares her experience. In Nebraska, there's only, currently, there's just one birth center. So the options are to birth at the birth center, which is in Lincoln, which is still under the insurance umbrella of uh, CHI Health, or um, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, and then hospital births. Um, And then there's two, there's a Methodist Women's Hospital in Omaha, which is, um, Their specialty is birth, and then St. Elizabeth also in Lincoln. They have like a labor and delivery unit that is pretty close to a birth center, I would say. And they're Catholic, and that's the thing. And they're their most popular place to birth. And so, yeah, it does. It comes back to that, um, you know, it's inundated with religion. Um, Speaking back to the idea of home birth specifically, uh, it is illegal to have an assisted home birth in Nebraska. I know that birth happens and there's no criminalization of people that are birthing children should it happen at home but if a certified midwife is to attend that it is considered illegal and there are there's a history of prosecution and persecution of said people that are attending these births and so knowing that in my choice I've lived in a number of places outside of growing up and leaving Nebraska when I was a teenager, but most recently before coming back and putting roots down here was in Colorado, and the decision was just not a question to me in terms of should I add another level of stress and illegality to what seems like just a very clear choice and how I want to bring life into this world. And I was able to access someone who's working as a midwife that had a sliding scale that was accessible to me. And But just to see models in that were just so matter-of-fact in somewhere that has a legal border for across the state from Nebraska, and then to cross that, there's this whole illegality and taboo that goes with it. And then just the idea of being on stolen land where the larger ideas of what's legal and illegal has always served people in power who have been property owning white men and there's there's definitely a lot of need and uh there's abortion protesters almost daily at the one planned parenthood that's in lincoln um the access is abysmal and for even for folks that can access Planned Parenthood and services there, there's still many barriers. And it's so it's not just Nebraska, but there's definitely a lot, a lot of barriers here. Alex's candid story of choosing to travel across state lines to give birth highlights the lack of choice that people giving birth have in Nebraska. And while she doesn't get into it so much here, there are many reasons why people may choose to have home births. One of the most prominent ones likely being the positive health outcomes for parent and child. A 2009 study of births in Canada found that the rate of perinatal death per 1,000 births was 0.35 among people having planned home births, while it was 0.64 among those attended by a physician. Additionally, the study found that people having planned home births were significantly less likely than those who planned a hospital birth to have obstetric interventions such as electric fetal monitoring or adverse maternal outcomes such as a third or fourth degree perineal tear or postpartum hemorrhage. Lastly, the study also found that newborns in the home birth group were less likely than those in the hospital birth group to require resuscitation at birth or oxygen therapy beyond 24 hours. Findings like these are still pretty contested in the medical landscape of the U.S., where 99% of births occur in hospitals. But I bring in statistics like these to say that people have very good medical reasons for choosing to have a home birth, in addition to the desires like those Alex expressed to have choice and body sovereignty in the birthing process. Now we'll hear from Coop, 
about their experience in terms of gender and sexuality in Nebraska. Hui, since being here, um, for good and bad, it's really made me decide you know, how do I want to live out my politics? Uh, what are my boundaries around that? How far am I willing to push? I was met with almost immediate resistance, <clears throat> in part because I'm read as a masculine person and what does it mean to be a masculine person and what is deemed a, like a feminine space. Uh, especially when you're, I mean, if you're talking about birth or you're talking about abortion, uh, a masculine presence um, is an uncomfortable one. And that's something that I, I navigate personally and am very careful to to walk around. And I also got a lot of pushback as someone who is trans. So like my body is able to become pregnant. And as someone who is a queer identified person and who wants to support that community, a lot of the feedback that I initially got was, oh, you, you want to work with the gays. Um and not not understanding why language is important in this work and i just be i got so angry and so frustrated so quickly because it seemed no matter where i would go people just they weren't understanding what i was talking about and there was no willingness to continue that conversation um and a lot of feedback that i got <clears throat> was well maybe you it's just not right here like maybe it just can't happen here like nebraska is not ready Maybe you need to go out to Seattle or Portland or the Bay Area and, like, get the work done that you want to get done and then bring it back here. And maybe, like, maybe then they'll be ready. And I think since meeting these two folks, I've, you know, been like, no, fuck that. (laughs) You know, like, I get really frustrated when people tell me, like, oh, this is just Nebraska. Like, this is Nebraska culture. You can't change Nebraska culture. And for me, I'm like, what does that mean for people who choose to put down roots in Nebraska or, or who have or are here for any number of reasons? Um, it just, that doesn't seem right. Um, and so I decided, no, like I want to push this, um, despite the fact that it is constantly uncomfortable and it's a lot of me expending energy, uh, that I often don't feel that I have. So that's both a negative and a positive, right? It's, it's me saying like, thank you, Nebraska for, uh, helping me, you know, get past my own comfort zone to be like, no, this work is really important. This has to happen. I want to have these conversations. These conversations are important. One of the most exciting things for me about talking to Coop, Amber and Alex was their obvious passion for reproductive justice and the nascent stage of their organizing in a state with a long and strong history of so-called pro-life advocacy. These folks are building the resources they see needs for and that they need themselves. Hear a bit more about their plans in their own words. Where we're going seems really organic and timely in the sense that it's really necessary. And I think we're all in it for the long game, meaning like we found work that is necessary, that resonates with all of us and our personal experiences and those in the immediate communities around us, and that we're building it in the way that we want it to be. And I'm I'm personally also like wanting to do more listening to what people need in this community but also trying to listen to the more marginalized voices because I think these are voices that have been surviving in situations and in the margins of the dominant way that things are and that's that's where um, I think some of the like the strongest skill set is is that survival and so right now uh, not having a clear direction feels great because it's it's giving us so much time to learn from each other and to learn from other people and really decide and take time to figure out, okay, this is what this could look like here. This is what needs to happen. And how can we best serve our communities, plural? If you're interested in learning more about the womb continuum and doulas, Coop, Amber, and Alex highly suggested the work of Samantha Zipora, who offers courses and resources online that I'll link to in the show notes. I've also found Miriam Zola Perez's blog and book, The Radical Doula, to be a wonderful intersectional guide to birth work. You can head to 50feministates.com to find links to those resources, as well as audio from this episode. As we wrap this first episode, I just want to say that the beginning of 50 Feminist States is really about beginnings. The state of my family's beginnings in the United States, the state of what it's like to begin life in this state of Nebraska, and the state of what it means to be organizing for reproductive justice. There's a beginning there, too. Next episode, we'll travel one state west to Wyoming. Until then, I'll see you on the road. Thanks 
for tuning in to this episode of 50 Feminist States. You can follow 50 Feminist States to stay updated on episodes and road trip happenings on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. That's F-I-F-T-Y Feminist States. Our opening music is by Lobo Loco, and this wonderfully sexist song that you're listening to on our way out is a recording by Billy Murray from 1916. Special thanks go out to Coop, Alex, and Amber for meeting with me, as well as to my family for providing more information on our history in Nebraska. I also have to thank the hundred or so Kickstarter backers who made funding this season possible. Until next time, Wild Ones, we'll see you on the road. You made the grizzly bear get up and do the hula dance, but can you tame wild women? If you can, please tame my wife.